Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to your Hump Day edition. It is Wednesday, the 29th of June. I hope you had a great trading session out there, even though, uh, well, I guess I, I did have some trades. I closed out some of my options, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Anyway, nice shout out to our faithful regulars who are here today early. We got Doug, Siraj, Ron, Glenn, Mesnock, Sue, and Les, of course, from Cape Canaveral. Hope y'all did fantastic. So uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, today, obviously, as I mentioned, is the 29th of June, so we're getting right into the tail end of the month. We'll have our mo uh, monthly recap here in just a day or so, just so I can go over all the numbers, which I love doing at the end to recap what we did, how we moved, how we fluctuated, etc. So I had a bunch of questions, so I'm going to show you the title slide, and then it's almost like a little bit of a clickbait because I want to talk about the markets first. But our topic, after I get through the markets, we'll do some analysis on those markets overall, is going to be trading junk stocks. I, I've received several questions, and one came in today that's kind of spurred me a little bit to to do, um, I guess, a special show on this. And I, I just don't know why people do it. If you're trading trash, you're probably going to get trash results. Um, you know, you look at junk collectors. I watch a couple shows on cars, and these guys that are rebuilding cars, they go around to junk, sh uh, you know, scrapyards, and maybe they find a piece, but. The person who's got that scrapyard, I mean, you're lucky, unless you're a real specialist, to make any money selling junk. And I think it's the same thing goes for trading. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But I want to start off with the top seven markets. We'll even look at the dollar, we'll look at some bonds, maybe a smattering of cryptocurrencies, even the junk cryptocurrencies. So let's go to our charts here and start at the bottom with crude oil. Uh, as you can see, we had that 114.54 mark kind of drawn a couple days ago just because that was where the origin of this last huge spike down was. We came right up to it today and then ultimately sold off, closing near the lows on the session for crude oil down about 2.08%. Still clinging above 100 bucks a barrel though, 109.44, so no reprieve yet, even though us great Californians will get $1,050, up to $1,050 uh, back from our state. That just reeks of stupidity. Printing money got us into the problem. Let's print more. Uh, here's your Russell 2000. Today retraced down to that 1700 mark. It, it actually hit an intraday low, as you can see on this price chart. Intraday low was 1702. So basically come right down to that 1700 mark, which we had mapped out as well. A very logical bounce point, uh, which it did today. Again, I'm not sure what's going to transpire tomorrow. We will talk about those GDP numbers, which came out today and we're worse than expected but the russell down 0.87 as we speak right now at 1723 now as a kind of a change of pace normally the indexes are all clumped together or grouped together today i'm looking at bitcoin actually taking over that fifth place spot bitcoin is down just 0 0.30 percent but really there is no story to talk about here with crypto it's just sideways i guess the only thing that you could say is michael saylor bought 10 more million dollars worth of bitcoin today making um, uh, MicroStrategy's average price right around $30,000 per Bitcoin, which means they are underwater in a big way. All right, moving up the ladder again, out of out of character, we've got gold in fourth place, and then we'll get to our major three indexes. That yellow box, or I'll just say it's the gold box because it has kept gold contained. Today came right down to the lower end of it, which is kind of that demand zone that goes back to June 15th, and also yeah, it hits a little points of contact going back into May of 2020 as well. Right now, an interesting point for gold because it's challenging those lows. Again, how do we play that? Well, I guess it depends on your objective. You know, if you are someone who's more aggressive, you could be going long on gold or GLD. You could be selling some puts here because you don't think it's going to go lower than that. Um, or you could be buying some calls, which would probably be cheap right now because price has been declining. And maybe you do calls at 1880. Well, Actually, probably not going to trade G uh, gold futures options, but maybe do GLD. Or you wait, wait for the breakout. And if this thing does break down below, let's say 1800, you might have a pretty decent short on. As you can see, there are a lot of potential stopping points once you get below 1800. But gold looking rather weak, as are a lot of commodities, as we talked about yesterday. All right, now our podium third place finish is the S&P. I did close out 50% of my position. I actually was going to close it all out, and I thought, you know what? I'll just do half. So I close out half of my S&P puts today. Uh, let's see, we are down, right now down 0.08%. Really a small indecision day. And, and conveniently, you know, we drew this yellow box yesterday and it's, it's ironic that the entire candle today stays right inside that yellow box. So um, another hesitation type of candle that's called a spinning top doji, where it open and closes right around the same price and has small topping and bottoming tails. 
We'll see what happens when we bust out of that one tomorrow, which I'm pretty sure it will. I just don't know which way it's going to go. Uh, blessings to you too, Kev. Good to see it. Um, second place, NASDAQ. Again, I closed out half of my NASDAQ position today, partly for the same reason. It was just kind of at the bottom end of that zone. I, I maybe left a little bit of money on the table early on, but uh, did okay overall on those two halves of the position for the NASDAQ 100. Uh, on the day, looking as of right now, up 0.13% uh, for the NASDAQ, but again, spinning top doji, which represents indecision. And finally, the Dow, up 0.29%. Same picture as those other major indexes with the spinning top doji, which again, just represents indecision. For those of you who are wondering, how on earth do you trade those? It's simple. You just put a line on the top side of it, which would be like right there. You put a line on the underside of it right there. And you say, if it breaks out of that range, go long to the upside. If it breaks down below it, go short to the south side. Easy, simple, peasy wheezy. Okay, uh, dollar is one thing I also want to look at because we've had two pretty strong bullish moves up in the dollar over the past couple of days. We looks to me, again, like I said, I think we'll be challenging 106 here probably in the next week or two. I feel like you're going to start to see more strength coming into that dollar just based off what's going on from the economy perspective. Uh, dollar is at, right now at 105 and 9 cents. Uh, last piece that we'll get, and then we'll get into the uh, trading junk, which some people I know are here just for that. Um, was the bond market fairly weak showing for the bond market down just ever so slightly but it, you know it's kind of similar to what we see with gold if we have a um, further downside move you know it, it feels like it's making lower lows and lower highs here on that 10 year which means that yields are dropping and the price of those bonds would be moving up so for those of you that are in things like TLT you, know, you are seeing some nice little up moves here and I'll talk more about that as we progress through today um, but that's pretty much it I think I yeah, this is the 10-year and the two-year. This is be our inverted yield curve, but uh, we're still drifting down. If we get below this green line, then we'll have another inversion of the yield curve, and that could be potentially a recessionary sign as well. Uh, Marilla, isn't that ES yellow box cutting through candles? Yep, yep, yep. I missed the show. Yeah, so it is cutting through candles. I don't, I don't mind cutting through candles, personally. I know a lot of people are totally against that one. Um, you're referencing this bad boy here. Yeah, I forgot exactly why we drew this in. I think we drew this... I don't remember when we do this one. And we draw in so many damn lines. I should probably just take these things off after a while. Where was it? I think it was actually as we came back into it. I had it mapped out from this supply zone that goes back to uh, this is on a four hour time frame going back to June 15th. Uh, that was that turning point where it hit a couple times uh, and ultimately broke through it. And now we're back to it. So it's that old adage of what was support becomes resistance, etc. Uh, what, what becomes supply? What was supply becomes demand once it's broken. Uh, made a decision not to tender spirit stock at 30 bucks each. Well, we could uh, certainly there's the spirit, the jet blue thing. That's just like a little drama soap opera piece that will probably continue on. It feels like it's almost like an Elon Musk type of saga. Oh, we're going to talk trash about each other and hopefully piss each other off. All right, let me go into the trading junk thing because I want to make sure I get this out of the way because it's um, kind of annoying, honestly, but it, it's really, I guess, inexperienced. And I look back on my trading history and I'm definitely a victim of this. And the graphic I chose specifically, because you see a bunch of crap here. You know, you see old bookcases and broken TVs, some CDs, a couple beer cans, some batteries, milk cartons. I mean, it's just, it's just trash. And for most things uh, that are trash, you should just leave them alone. However, all of us have looked at a price chart and thought to myself, or thought to yourself, wow, this chart in particular, it had a high price of, let's say, $150. And now it's trading at 3 Man, this stock is great. It's just really sold off right now. And it, it's going to come back. It has great potential and prospect. And that's what we convince ourselves. However, if we looked at the fundamentals, they probably look like dog poop. If you look at the technicals, they still look terrible because the thing's still in the downtrend. Yet people insist on buying them simply because there's this hopium, right, that it's going to get back to those highs. And I have, I think, three or four examples of that today sent in from viewers. So uh, I'll say this early on. I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to be condescending, but I am a tough love kind of person. So if you send in a question um, and it's something I think is just an absolutely horrible trade, I'll say it. But again, you know, you got to make your own decisions here on what you want to do with regards to um, making uh, those, those trades. So let me go. I'm going to skip the economic stuff here for just a second. All right. So when you think of trash, um, I, I, I'll know I will offend many people here, and I apologize. It's not my goal to offend you. But as an individual, this individual has one of the most documented uh, historical trails of failure as a business person, right? It, it, there's, there's 
case after case after case after case where his businesses have gone under. They've been fraught with fraud, uh, all, all sorts of issues with this company, which to me makes this individual a very bad business person. And I would never buy into a business that had anything to do with this individual. Now, what am I talking about? Uh, let's see, Lee asks, thoughts on DWAC, attractive at 2257. Of course, for those that don't know, DWAC is the Donald Trump media SPAC, C-D-W-A-C. Um, I have literally zero interest. If you said, hey, Marone, I've got $10,000 for you to invest. First off, I'll never invest anybody's money, so don't even think about it. But here is DWAC, right? This is one of those ones I think people are just hoping that Donald Trump will create the most epic media company in the world, yada, yada, yada. I don't think anything's going to come of it. I think this thing is going to be just total garbage. So I, I will not be touching DWAC at all. And now, uh, let me put a number on you. You put 2257, so this was actually just sent in today. And, and Lee, I got to say thank you uh, because you kind of inspired me to do the show specifically on junk stocks. Now, I guess we could ask the question, is there a possibility that Trump does manage to a, get all this financing and get a media company off the ground and it becomes successful? Yes, there, it's absolutely a possibility. There's, there's no argument. It, there's a chance. However, everything you see coming out of this just seems like it's not going well. You've got upset investors. The, the SPAC piece is already a problem. And we know what SPACs do, right? A specialty purpose acquisition company or SPAC is what's called a blank check company. Now, what this company does, for those who may have missed the show I did, I think, a year or so ago, a SPAC will go public. And the only purpose of a SPAC is to acquire another company, acquire a private company and bring them public because the obstacles to go public are daunting. So in my mind, what you're seeing here with DWAC is just an outright money grab. It's saying, listen, we're going to ride the popularity of Trump, right? And I know some people hate him. Some people love him. Regardless, he has a massive following of people. Let's not talk about his fan base, but that's just what it is. And a lot of people would say, I'm going to go, if Trump goes there, I'm going there. And that's their prerogative. However, Trump is shrewd. He knows that he has this faithful following that will follow him wherever he goes. So you start a SPAC or you, you go to a SPAC and you start a media company. You have that SPAC by the media company. They may be one and the same, right? This is why I don't trust it at all because you could very easily, um, you could very easily create a SPAC and then go and purchase a company that you had some relationship with. Now here's the rub. The SPAC is just going to pay a price for it. And again, you don't know the details of that. You don't know what the fundamentals of this new uh, media company are. Are they making money? You won't know because it's private. What's their prospects? You won't know because it's private. So the SPAC will pay whatever amount they feel. And what I've seen in my personal experience, because I actually was in a SPAC with B, um, with Backed was one that I was in, what I've seen happen over and over again is the SPAC will overpay for those companies to make it happen. And of course, make it all exciting for the private company to now go public. They circumvent all the SEC loopholes or, 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 or rules. And now they're a publicly traded company. They got paid a ton of money. The SPAC made a ton of money. And they're the ones who walk away from this thing rich. And the shareholders are the ones left holding the bag as it comes crashing back down. So I, I would not touch it. Um, you know, Look at the price chart. What's it telling you? It's telling you it's a SPAC because it was at 10 bucks. And then all of a sudden you had your hype Okay, it's going to do buy, buy Trump's media company. And then it had a, another momentary run up and it's just drifting back down. Like most SPACs, my guess is this will probably come back and challenge that $10 mark. So I'm not shorting it. I'm not going long. I really don't. I really don't care. You know, this is one that um, I, the, the phrase I love in Latin or Greek, I think it's Latin, is caveat emptor, buyer beware. So Lee, um, attractive at twenty two fifty, I think it's more attractive at ten bucks. But honestly, I don't think this is attractive. Period, and that's just my personal preference. Some of you who believe that this could be the next great Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, is it worth a shot? If you have disposable capital, sure, go for it. Um, but I don't know. I just think that the odds are too slim. I, I think what you're going to see from this show today is, I, I think part of the factor to my longevity and success in financial markets has been a move away from gambling and a move towards probability. I am much more inclined to say this one's not going to give me option A will not give me the greatest rate of return, but I have a much higher probability of being correct and making a little money versus option B, which is this one's a, a shot in the dark, but man, what a great rate of return. I could crush it on this trade. 
I, I don't really do that anymore. Um, maybe I'm just old, but that's the change I've had. So that was the first one from Lee on DWAC. To me, junk stock, staying away from it. Um, <laughs> junk stock number two, Kevin. Do you think Snapchat selling a premium version will boost their share price? Okay, so Snapchat is now in talks to have different levels of subscription. You have a premium level, which gives you access to more stuff. Look, I'm not a big fan of Snapchat just as a technology, but I'm older. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit older, so I, I still am trying not to use TikTok or any of these new social media platforms. Um, I kind of like to keep my private life private, as you guys may have guessed or seen. I don't really use social media much. You know, I'll post out a couple of things. Um, I'll post a couple of things on, on the show or guests and things like that, but I really don't like to do social media very much. That said, people love Snapchat. Create some funny filter, make yourself look like a shark on a phone call or something. Great, go for it. What does the chart look like? Let's go SNAP. Uh, I was short Snapchat. I kind of wish I still held my shorts, but I am no longer short. Um, you know, you got to look at this chart here, Kevin, and... <sighs> And you just ask yourself, where's it going, right? This, if, if I had to guess, it's going down. Why? It's just going down. It's lower highs, lower lows. And I can do everything in my power to will this thing to go up, but it's not. Um, what are some other companies that recently said they're going to start uh, subscription models, right? You have a few that we're going to start charging for ads. Um, Actually, Google did that, but that's not going to be really reflected in their share price. They tried that with the Google TV, and they kind of uh, stepped away from that. Um, you know, things that are subscription-based, where they start raising their subscriptions. Here's another one, NFLX. Everyone's like, oh, raising their subscription is going to help their bottom line. Maybe that's why Jim Cramer said to buy this back in January at $600. Well, it's done nothing but tank. So if I look at Snapchat, I would categorize this as a junk stock. I think it's falling out of favor. I think it was a cool fad for a little while, kind of like... Uh, uh, MySpace, right? MySpace ain't around anymore. That was the coolest thing in the world back then. Uh, yes, it is a SPAC, and we can bring that one up. I'll show you one easy way to find out here in just a second on, on um, CLOB. So, you know, if you're dying on this one, SPAC, or Kevin, and you will say, hey, I really want to buy some Snapchat, forget about your, this is the tough part, forget about your opinion of Snapchat, forget about anything that you've read or seen or heard, because reading press releases, from Snapchat about them doing new fee structure. They are written in a way that makes you want to buy it. It's a marketing verbiage said, basically printed, so you go read this and go, wow, this is gonna save Snapchat, I gotta buy it. That, that's a designed by the marketing departments of Snapchat. So forget all that stuff. Look at the price chart. If you are interested in owning Snapchat, look at the price. Where would you be interested in buying? For me, it's very simple. I still would not be interested at any price. But look right here. All right, you've got these, these highs that are roughly $15.75. And right now, it's trading at uh, $13.96. So if it starts to manage to, to rise up and gets above, let's say, let's call it 16 bucks. Let's give ourselves a little bit of a cushion here. Right? I'll leave this line here at 16 bucks. And if it does get above this, this may be a sign. And I would say it needs to be a close. But it's a sign that it's making some higher highs for once. I mean, it hasn't been making higher highs for the longest time. And if it does that, I think there's a very good chance that Snapchat fills this gap. But I'm not going to anticipate it. It's like saying I'm dropping a knife through space, right? And it's a, a very sharp knife. I'm dropping that knife through space and I say, oh, I'll just catch it before it falls, before it hits the ground, right? Well, if I don't know where the ground is for the knife to fall and stop moving, then that's an extremely dangerous proposition. It's much safer to let the knife fall, stick into the floor, and then you go, okay, it's stopped moving. Okay, I stopped that knife. It, it's way safer for you. Not as exciting. You're not going to get as many tips in the tip jar from catching a knife that already hit the ground, but you're also not going to be losing fingers and limbs and severing arteries with it. So this to me is simple. Let it prove to you that things moving up. It looks like garbage right now. I think it's going to continue to stay garbage because price is telling me. And I don't know what the reasons are. I don't particularly care. I can hypothesize, and everybody here could offer a hypo hypothesis about why Snapchat's going down. And we could all offer about why it's just not moving up. Who cares? Your opinions don't mean anything. It's the price chart that means everything. That's what we're trading. That's what I'm trying to make money off of is this price chart. So, Kevin, I would say leave old Snapchat alone. Um, I, I don't know if the selling a premium service is going to boost their share price. 
Bottom line is they need more users. I think you have to start attracting more people to your platform. And now everyone's using TikTok, right? So Snapchat was like the TikTok of old where you could send little videos in private and secret. Now everyone wants to use TikTok. So in, in another six months, we'll probably see people move away from, maybe not six months, maybe another year. It'll be some other new platform. And TikTok or the, the other social media platform will just decline like Zoom did. So there you go for that one, Kevin. All right, let's go to, to real big junk stocks. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one because we've talked about this for so long and uh, a while back, and you guys know my opinion on this one. Lee says, I know you don't like GameStop, but the chart has a lot of volatility. I've been doing great. First off, I will say congrats, Lee. I'm glad you're doing well. Um, there is a ton of volatility in this one. Let's take a look at the GameStop chart. So actually, before I show the chart, as a company, as a business model, again, I think that GameStop is absolutely doomed. Great, I have to sneeze. Whew. Absolutely doomed. Um, again, we're not using physical games anymore. We're just downloading directly from the PlayStation, directly from the Xbox, directly from your Twitch, directly from your phone. No one needs to go to the store to buy games anymore. So to me, that's a, just a dead model, right? As soon as Netflix came along, what do you think happened to Blockbuster? Killed it, right? So I think that GameStop is in the exact same category. To me, this is long-term junk. It's slowly going to disappear. Now, if we look at the price chart of GameStop, you're absolutely right. I mean, these are some colossal swings. It may not look like much, but let me just, um, let's get some of these lines off here because they're all old. Uh, let's put a yellow box around, let's see, let's go to the most recent range bound. So here's the a big range, and this is really over the last, let's just say, year. It's less than that. This is like the last six months. The last six months, GameStop has had a high of, let's call it 200 bucks and a low of 75. That's a $125 range. Yeah, tremendous opportunity. However, recently, things have become much more compressed and you can see that the range has shrunk, but it's still a $35 range. Yes, tremendous opportunity in here. My, my concern is for Lee or anybody else who wants to trade GameStop, you have to understand the dynamics of GameStop. There still are a lot of people with diamond hands. Well, I forgot how they do the diamond hands. That's a hard, but remember the diamond hands people? I'm never going to sell GameStop. It's going to a thousand. It's like, yeah, I, no. Even though you did a short squeeze on it, and yes, you caught a couple of uh, hedge funds off guard, as soon as that thing rallied up over to 200 bucks, what do you think those hedge fund managers did? They came back in, they just started shorting the hell out of it. Because if you look at the price chart, all right, if you go back to here, Let's go all the way back to uh, 2021, actually even before that, right here. You go back into 2020, GameStop had over a 100% short interest, meaning that every share that was available was already short. That part, I don't even know how they could possibly do that. So if 100% if of the shares are short, then if it doubled, if all those shorts were covered, price would go to 40 bucks. Well, it went to 483 because of all of the... Um, there's options issues that happened there. It was a Vega bomb, which caused this thing to rip up. If you don't know what Vega bomb is, look at the old shows we did with Corey Lane. It was an awesome show uh, right around this time in 2021, talking about the Vega bomb and kind of how it um, forced this market to spike like this. Now, to think that it's going to get back up there to $483, I would encourage you to put down the crack pipe. It's never going to happen. I mean, even if, even if they decide to call themselves a blockchain company or a cryptocurrency asset, it's not gonna happen i mean this thing is this is trash so lee it sounds to me like you're an active trader and i can respect that if you're an active short-term trader then this is a gold mine right this is very exciting the danger is you have all these reddit wall street bets guys who are holding shares of it and they're very they say they have diamond hands which means they're gonna hold forever i think a lot of them are gonna have paper hands and you could see very quick sudden moves here on the part of the institutions to manipulate those diamond ham kids, right? Get them all to jump and get knocked out of this trade. So to me, this is another junk stock. I don't think this has a high probability of long-term growth at all. However, I think there's tremendous short-term opportunity in this one, as you said. Uh, what did Tom say? I don't think the need for DWAC is there right now. The Twitter is being pulled back. Yep. Right. And, you know, it's interesting how, how Elon is kind of positioning this with Twitter as this is the place you need to be. I mean, he's really been making it a big point that he wants to have at least half the world using Twitter. And, you know, when you open up the boundaries to all the countries or borders, I guess, and or the boundaries, 
to all these different countries, you know, it could be a very powerful platform. Again, my concern is that if you control the narrative, if you control the dissemination of information, then you start to create manipulation. And I won't mention any specific news programs, but you guys know that there are clearly news channels that are extremely far right. And their news is so biased that anybody who watches those programs are being brainwashed and manipulated to believe all that news. That said, you've got other channels that are so far to the left that they're being brainwashed. And again, I, I, I'm disappointed in our country because I feel like it's polarizing us even more and making us hate the other side. Let's be amicable, sit and listen to what we each other have to say and maybe move forward together. But we're, we're being ripped apart by media in my mind. So I'm a little concerned that Twitter, um, you know, even though it may have been swung to one side, who knows it might not go to the other side, right? And all of a sudden we start to see that media, that control unit, which is Twitter, Rigging, not rigging, but manipulating elections. That that kind of scares me. I'm not mentioning names, Lori. I don't want to get anybody's bad side here. Um, Apple should buy GameStop. <sighs> Wristwatches died years ago, and then Apple decided, yeah, their captive customers would pay them to watch. I'm sure Apple can make, yeah. Well, that, I guess that's pretty funny. That's pretty fun. They can make their customers buy physical games. Uh, I understood a little bit the wristwatch. Like it's okay. I get it. I mean, I'm not a watch fan, obviously, as you guys can see, no tan lines here. Um, but at least it serves a purpose, right? The watch can do so many things. I mean, especially those of you who are looking to do fitness, it tracks your steps and your heartbeat and health. And I mean, you can really, it's a very useful tool to have a watch. What does a game do, right? I just don't see it. All right, I'm the weird one. Elon doesn't want chat controlled. I And good. I, I, I kind of feel, I think that, and this is probably where I, I would um, create differences of opinions among some of you. I am definitely a free speech person. I, I absolutely am waving the banner of free speech. However, when your free speech starts to create hate um, through, the, through the words that you use, then I think you should not have a voice. I think you should um, be muted. If you're, if you're inciting hate and violence on, in society, mute them. Let's get them out of there. All right, let me see. And the last one. Oh, God, Daniel. And, okay. So we've looked at a few of them so far. We looked at GameStop, which I think is just going the way of the dodo. It'll be a blockbuster. That thing is dead. We looked at DWAC. DWAC could have some potential. But if I have the spectrum of probability, this is like a three standard deviations out. I mean, this is a very slim chance in my mind of succeeding and being everything that it may have been touted as and, and taking on Twitter. Then we had, um, what was the other one? Uh, Snapchat. Well, Snapchat's established. I just feel like it's losing its its grip on the younger generation. I feel like it's slipping its market capitalization and dominance. So, you know, I, I don't see that changing. This next one, uh, I definitely have some opinions on. And this goes to Daniel. Daniel, love the question. Thank you. He said, I bought some Carnival Carnival Corp on their earnings call last week. Was trading at 10 bucks. What do you? Th when do you think we back to the 70s? <laughs> Well, kind of humorous there because I don't know if it will be back to the 70s. But let's look at Carnival Cruise Lines. And again, this isn't just Carnival. It's it's uh, Norwegian and there's a few other Royal Caribbean cruise lines. Uh, I think we all know and agree that, you know, car cruise ships probably not the best place to go for anybody who has any issue with COVID. So if you're one of those people that, like wants to wear a mask all the time, great. Good for you. You should wear a mask if you're not comfortable going out in society. You know, if, it, if it's something that freaks you out, please wear a mask. Um, then I think there's those that, sh if they're comfortable with it and want to take that risk, don't wear a mask. However, you get on a cruise ship, you're kind of stuck in confined spaces. And if it's a really packed cruise, you know, you got the dance halls, you got all the little bars and social areas, the pool. Uh, it might be rather dangerous. So I think most people are foregoing cruise ships. And that's reflected in their price charts. I mean, let's go back into 2020 when this thing really took a nosedive. Um, Carnival Cruise Lines, by the way, was already trending down. Carnival Cruise Lines was trending down since 2018. They were up at 72 bucks, and by the time the COVID pandemic hit, they were at 51. So they already saw a significant, a significant decline in their share price. So there was something already wrong with Carnival before that, but COVID hit. It went from 51 all the way down to lows of like seven bucks. Man, just absolutely murdered. Now, are they back on track? No. Are they? Are their cruises leaving and, and going places? Yes, uh, certainly is. But if you bought here, all right, I'm just uh, gonna just kind of go through um, my thought process. If you were buying in this part of the chart, all right, you guys can see we've got on the right hand side that things are moving up. I, I would say good for you. 
And I would say you have a good probability that price is going to continue moving up. Why? Because you're making higher highs and higher lows. That trend had reversed. However, there is a longer term trend in play here, which um, it's going to be a really kind of an ugly line. You could draw it through there is where I would normally draw it. Um, you could also draw them through the, where the most points of contact are, which would be right through there. Either way, this new uptrend here is slowly moving up towards these trend lines. So I, I would be okay with buying in the uptrend part. Now, if, if you ask me what you want to do now, I would say stay short. We, we are now in back to the downtrend. We're continuing. You got lower lows and lower highs. So I, I realize what you're thinking here, Daniel. Um, I'm not sure why you bought on the earnings call last week. I think that, that is, that's, that's gambling, my friend, is, is trading earnings call. But let's just zoom in. So here's your earnings call. It's this big green candle. What was uh, what, the 24th? So I don't know what price you're in at 10, but you bought the earnings call. And if I recall, the earnings weren't that great. I can bring the earnings calendar up here if you guys would like in just a second. But let's just um, walk through here. I, I guess you have to ask yourself, why would you be interested in possibly buying during this area, right? You're in, a, you're in a big downtrend. I guess you can make the argument that we did break above some very short-term highs, but you're still not out of the woods. To me, this is a case of short the rallies. So, you know, if if Carnival gets back up to this $14 mark, that looks like a great potential short opportunity. You have this nice area of consolidation. I'm moving the yellow box around for everybody. Uh, nice area of consolidation and then just a little rally base and a drop. Uh, to me, I would I would keep my short guns out. And if we look at this on the longer term, let's say a weekly, for example, you are back to those lows from 2020. And I think, Daniel, I guess if you are in chat, interact here, but I, I'm guessing that part of your decision to buy that was we've come into this demand zone, this, this historic low back here in 2020, and we've bounced out of that. Okay, I'll buy that momentum. And if you told me that was your reasoning, I would feel more comfortable with the trade. Like, okay, you're buying because of the demand zone. But just buying it and saying, what was your exact words here? Um, I bought some Carnival on their earnings call last week. Well, I apologize, but what the hell does that have to do with anything? Remember, earnings call are a way for anybody that's an executive in that company to spread kumbaya information. Right? You're not going to see too many people. Holy cow, Jay Best, thank you so much. I will get to that in just a second. Um, I appreciate that. That was very nice. Um yeah, I just don't see what an earnings call would have to do with it. Because, again, you're very rarely going to see a CEO come out and say, man, things look bleak for us. You should sell our stock. Right? They're going to say, you know, we do see some challenges ahead, but right now things are looking pretty good, and we're going to do this positive thing and this positive thing and this positive thing, and they'll forget to mention a lot of the negative things. So, um, to me, uh, I, I wouldn't touch it. I, I Right now, I would not touch Carnival. I want it to prove... It's starting to make some higher highs, higher lows. Um, Michael Curtis says they have to have mass debt due to COVID. Yeah, but remember, they got tons of bailouts too. Remember, the airlines and the cruise ships were getting hundreds of millions of dollars in bailouts to survive. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm not a fundamentals guy to look at their fundamentals and see like how, how are they doing. Uh, but my guess is, as you point out there, I think that they're struggling right now. I don't see people mobbing to get on cruise ships and you know how low a price can a cruise ship offer you to entice you to go for one i think i'm just kind of holding off now the reason i thought this one was interesting is i think we would all agree that there is no way that the cruise ship industry is going to die altogether it may have to morph and change a little bit so i don't think carnival is going away i don't think carnival is going to go to zero but i do think gamestop is right i don't think um norwegian cruise line is going to go to zero but I kind of think that Snapchat will over time, right? It's, unless it finds new followers, it's just it's not, not going to work out. Are cruise lines too big to fail? Can they be bailed out? Well, they were bailed out. They were. Uh, the big talk back here in 2020 was the bailouts for airlines and for cruise ships. Now, airlines, obviously, I know. So they got big bailouts and they're still tanking. Correct. I mean, I, I haven't been on one, but you mentioned that Lisa got, Lisa got COVID on her cruise last week. Last week. I'm sorry. Send, send uh, Lisa my best wishes. Hope she's doing okay. Um, I mean, you're in a very crowded space where people are drinking and yelling and partying and having fun. Uh, you know, it's like if you go to a concert right now, you know, your odds are pretty good. You know, when I got COVID, I was at a fish concert in Las Vegas. So I don't know how many umpteen thousand people in a very tight place. Even with a mask on the entire time, I got COVID. Um, yeah, I, you know, you can be as careful as you want to be. Can still get it. So, um, Daniel, I don't 
if you ask about when it came back to the 70s, I would not hang my hat on when it's getting back to the 70s. Like, I'd be lucky if it gets back up to the 30s. All right? Um, I would, yeah, definitely not the most optimistic for Carnival. All right, so those are junk. Those are trash. And Jeff, Jay Best, before we finish here, I will get to that one. I want to get to two more questions here that, are, that have just come in. Uh, Chase talks about Uber and Lyft. All right, U-B-E-R. So would, would, would this be considered a junk stock? In my mind, absolutely not. I think it may have been, you know, it reached some legal troubles with regards to unions and, and rights and, and kind of uh, state laws. But I think we'd all agree that Uber and Lyft are so instrumental. And personally, I love Ubers. I think, I, I don't know this for a fact. And I, if anybody wants to do the research, I'd love to see it. The amount of drunk driving deaths now versus pre Uber, pre Lyft. Because, you know, there's been times where I've gone down to my local watering hole and I walk outside, you know, I got my car keys. I'm like, I'm just calling Uber. There's no way I'm driving home right now. And, you know, how many lives has that saved? So I think as a, as a societal benefit, Uber and Lyft have made it very easy, especially for people that don't have money to own a car. They can get transportation when they need it. So I don't see that model changing. What I think might happen is I think you might see a competition in this space where, as you see it now, Uber is... A business where they contract out, you take your personal car and you, uh, you know, turn into a business and drive people around. Great. Personally, I think that that's great for another few years. My guess is that within five years, five years is kind of my, my, my ultimate for this one. I think that you will have Tesla. Have a, Basically, Tesla will be a taxi service as well. There will be an arm of Tesla that they're basically just producing Teslas. They're autonomous vehicles that you can now have an app. You log into your Tesla app, and I'll be sitting at the bar somewhere. I hit a button, and the car, without a driver, will just show up and pick me up and take me wherever it wants to go. And it will just do that all night long. It's basically a driverless taxi. And I think that Tesla has such a huge advantage in AI that they'll be first to market with that product. But that's not going to kill Uber for, for years. So I, I, I think Uber is probably doing pretty good. Let's go if... T- Lyft looking a lot worse. I mean, down at 14 bucks. Goodness, you know, it just begs the question: Do you want to buy some of this? Um, personally, I don't right now. I just, I just not in a long-term buy mood for anything. But I would do the same thing that I did with uh, the other chart we just looked at, which is, you know, find a level where this starts to make higher highs. Right? Show me on this chart at any point where Lyft has made a higher high. It hasn't. The only time it made a higher high was actually right back here. It just barely made it, and that was back in November of 2021 when it was at 57 bucks. It's now at 14. Has not made a lower low, or a higher high at all, and it's been nothing. So this is like a perfect downtrend. Until this changes, stay short lift. Even though I love the company, love the concept. Hey Don, good to see you. Um, and same thing with Uber, right? It hasn't made a higher high. It just keeps going and going and going and going and going and going. So stay stay short those ones. All right, let me get to this question from Jay before I forget. Again, Jay, thank you so much for the contribution. He says, uh, what are your thoughts on Celsius going forward? Rumor has it that Goldman Sachs is eager to buy them out. It seems like they overstated, overstaked too much Ethereum before the 2.0 launch. Yeah, it wasn't just the Ethereum. It was also the Three Arrows Capital. So 3AC is still the one that's looming. Um I have, I, I think it's like $25,000 sitting there right now. I have, from my perspective, I don't think I'm ever going to get it. Um, however, I think it makes sense from a systemic issue to just sell the company and, you know, move on. The question is, if Goldman buys them, do they still honor the deposits on hand? I, I don't know all the details of that. Uh, right now, I am in a rush myself personally. I'm pulling pretty much... Any crypto I have on lending protocols or lending sites are, I'm moving that off. I'm moving that off the table. So I'm looking at Celsius. Let me bring up the chart here for you with the crypto side. Let me go ahead and lock symbols. Let's go to sell. Uh, I'm looking at Celsius as a done deal for me. I, I, if, I, if I get that money back, that'd be amazing. But it's locked up. I can't move it out. It's just sitting there. I'm earning interest though, by the way. They keep sending me something every month saying, you're earning interest. I'm like, okay, well, uh, I can't do anything about it. So I, I'm optimistic that there might be something there with Goldman Sachs doing that deal, but I kind of wrote that money off. And I have a lot more at other exchanges that do lending. So I'm pulling it like Voyager, for example. Voyager now talking about um, them potentially missing their debt obligations. So um, I've got about five days left. I can only pull off 
10 grand a day. It used to be 25, but they dropped it to 10. So I have an alarm set and every day I will be pulling off that exchange until all my money is off of uh, Voyager, um, off of BlockFi, and hopefully off of Celsius here soon. But um, I think it's, it's both good and bad, right? The bad part here is if Celsius does not do any deal and just collapses, then my assets will be sold in the default. And I may get I may get something, but I'd have to file some, you know, go join some lawsuit. I was reading somewhere something interesting that if you file in small claims court, um, oh, it's at under twenty thousand dollars or something like that. Uh, you actually get ahead of other creditors. I want to make sure I got to look into that and see if I'm right, because uh, if that's the case, I might just go and, and do a small claims court and get something for my um, my money. But we'll see what happens. But not it's not looking that great, even though Goldman Sachs is there. Um, what do we got? GM's cruise division is already running robot taxi in San Francisco. Tesla top ten in autonomous. Mo yeah, I just don't know if I trust GM's AI. Where are they get? Are they Tesla's got more G, uh, more AI driving on the road than anybody, by by a large large margin. So um, I don't know. I think well, we'll see. We'll see how it all unfolds. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of competition in the space because ultimately we'll never have a yellow taxi again, or yellow taxi will be just a completely autonomous fleet which would be great all right um what else did i have on there do, 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 do. uh here's the last part and then i will uh go to whatever listener questions you guys had to make sure Merlin, you're going to talk about politics again today nope no more politics we're done we don't like toler we don't like politics is voyager still safe for usdc no voyager's not safe no not safe they, they have exposure. They said they did not have exposure, which is why I moved over a lot of capital to them. And then they all of a sudden made an announcement and people are talking about how they have exposure to Three Arrows Capital and potentially going to default on their debt obligations. So I'm moving everything off of Voyager just for now. All right. I will just move it off for now. Um, let's see. What was the one question there? I would have oh, this is the one I want to get to. Hood. How many times did we say in the past two months, Hood's going to get bought? It's just a prime candidate, right? Well, you guys may have heard FTX. Uh, the rumors are circulating that FTX is going to make a, an attempt to buy Hood, which is Robin Hood Markets. Um, good for them. You can see that the price has spiked from under 7 bucks to over, what were we at here? Um, to 972 so a pretty significant jump in just a period of about a week, giving back some of that now. Uh, if they do get acquired... Yeah, I think you'll see this thing surge quite a bit, but you know they got to bring uh, FTX on board. And FTX, by the way, is making a pretty big play in the space. I mean, they're now extending lines of credit to some of these lending protocols, right? And sending some money out there. And here you go, Celsius. Here you go, these uh, Voyager, etc. Now all of a sudden, going out after an exchange, they already are one of the largest crypto exchanges. So a lot of people have said that um, that uh, Sam Bankman Freed, Sam Bankman Freed is uh, the modern day robber baron, right? Lending out tons of money to companies to save them, but really for his own interest. And it'd be interesting looking forward uh, what this might look like. But here's a kid who's in his early 20s, sleeps on a beanbag in a floor in an apartment with six other people, and he's worth, I don't know, 20, 30 billion dollars. Just absolutely insane to me that that's the way it goes. But um, yeah, I, I, we talked about this one. I didn't want to buy any hood. just not my thing to, to bottom fish like this. You know, back here, I would say it's a junk stock. And, and it still is, but at least this has value, right? What's the value? The value is millions of people have accounts here. Now, granted, some of those accounts are only worth a couple hundred dollars because it's some, you know, 14-year-old kid in mom's basement buying shares of um, shares of, of Shibu Inu and Dogecoin thinking they're going to get rich. But it's still assets. It's still assets under management. It's still a massive database that now FTX is going to have direct access to. And of course, FTX would now have access to the U.S. equity markets. Uh, Hood is already doing crypto, so they'll just plug into FTX's exchange, uh, thus making FTX even bigger and bigger and bigger. And the good news uh, for me is I actually own FTX. Their, um, it's FX. FTT is the name of their, their coin or their token. But again, this will be an area of contention because... Wouldn't this be a security, right? FTX is not publicly traded, but they do have a token. And again, we'll we'll see. Uh, uh, yeah, Bankman's perfect name, right? I know. Did he did he pay for that name? It's crazy. PepsiCo. All right, one of the few that actually is looking okay, right? You have just 
huge sideways consolidation or sideways ranges from 153 all the way up to like 175, 176. Um, you know, if you look at the grand scheme of things, you could argue we are dead center of this range right here. All right. So from a trading perspective, let me put fibs on here. I'll just go from the, the, the base to the peak just for fun. And we are exactly in the middle here. We're just above that 50% retracement. So why is this important? Well, I guess it depends on what your goals and objectives are. If you're looking to go on long, you know, you are in the middle of a very tight range or very wide range. So yes, there is some upside potential here. Same thing is going down. But I think more importantly, this would probably be a decent spread trade. If you get that spread wide enough and find some premium in there between 153 and 180, go for it. You're in the middle of the range. So you're dead center. Um, the odds of, of it getting out of that range are rather slim at this point. But Pepsi looking decent, at least from an options trade. From a price perspective, uh, I don't really see it going anywhere. I actually, if I was to forecast what would happen with Pepsi just based off what this chart looks like, uh, let me do a repeat here, lock that one. We'll go here. All right, so I'm going to go boom. I think you'll see stuff like that, where it's just going to kind of traverse sideways for a while. But I don't see anything really exciting happening here with Pepsi. I don't see any breakout trades. I don't see any great trend other than sideways. <laughs> Shut up, Don. Shibu Inu will never go to a dollar. Even if they remove a zero from the total supply, Shibu Inu will not be going to a dollar. Shibu Inu won't even make it to 10 cents. Shibu Inu. The guy comes on here just to get me all riled up. Way to go. Way to go, Don. Um, all right, let me delete some of these things because I don't need those lines. Let's go look at Shibu Inu just because Don's here and he brought it up. So I got to... Bring up Shibu Inu. Oh, look at this quality bad boy. Oh, isn't that great? Wait, doesn't this look just like DWAC? Doesn't this look just like DWAC? We just looked at it. This looks like DWAC. This looks like uh, GameStop. This looks like Robinhood. Looks like all the crap companies we just looked at. Uh, maybe not as bad as... Uh, Carnival kind of had that same look, but... Uh, this is just a pump and a dump. Now, what was the one that you mentioned earlier? So asking... Um, there was a question about a specific... SPAC company, and I will get to that. I just got to scroll back through here. Clove, C L O V. So, if you're curious if something is a SPAC, there's a real easy one to. Ooh, um, this was uh, a SPAC. Yeah, this, so Clover is a SPAC. It's weird that the way this starts, normally they all start out at 10 bucks, and you'll see them go sideways for a while at 10 bucks. This one started at 10, had a big spike, and now it's worth two bucks. So, the key with these is in two years, and this started on June 12, 2020. Um, they have to make an acquisition within two years. Otherwise, they have to return the funds to the investor. So I'm not exactly sure how that works out, but we are past the June 20th date. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on here, but from everything I read, um, SPAC, specialty purpose acquisition companies, have two years to make their acquisition. If they don't, money goes back to where it came from. There you go. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Don't you got to look at Coke too? Oh, fine. Got to look at the brothers and sisters here, huh? All right. As you can see, I've got Jim Cramer's buy, buy call, which conveniently was this dead high. Love it. Just absolutely love that one. This one just, just cracks me up. Uh, Clove is one that I had for a while selling options against it. Sweet. As long as it, whatever your strategy, as long as it's working. Um, you know, Coca-Cola doesn't have, does not have the same picture as Pepsi, obviously, right? If we go to PEP real quick. You have a, a much wider range, but the trend for Pepsi, as you can see here, was rallying up. And really since uh, October of 2021, has not really been able to go anywhere. Coca-Cola, since 2021, has been making higher highs and higher lows. So I'm, I'm definitely more of a Coca-Cola fan than a Pepsi fan, although I'm trying to drink less, um, less soda. But right now, it doesn't look great, does it? If I just look at this part of the chart here, lower lows lower highs. So Coca-Cola is looking weaker at this point, but I would still make the same argument I did with Pepsi, which is check out the range. Here's your big range for the past few months. And we're dead center on it. So I don't see anything really exciting from a trading perspective here, unless you're selling, uh, doing spread trades and selling options. Um, <laughs> yeah. And not only is it two bucks, it looks like it's going uh, further lower. Michael, normally you get a, uh, you can tell us back by the, uh, here, I'll just show you. Normally you see this type of price action. So here's the Digital World Acquisition Corp. You see how over here it has these little horizontal lines. They usually go public at 10. They start at 10 bucks and then you'll see them fluctuate around 10 bucks. Uh, let me see if B, 
So here's Bact. This is the, one of the ones that I purchased back at, at I bought this at 15 bucks. Um, but you can see here, it was at 10 bucks and it's kind of just stuck there. They made news they were going to buy um, some crypto projects. They sold off. and for, I wrote this thing all the way down to 7 bucks. I purchased it at 15 uh, And then when it spiked up on this day, this is one of those shoulda, coulda, woulda moments, right? Uh, when it spiked up from 15 to 17 I sold at 17 you know, made a couple bucks, so I made two grand on the trade. But it rallied all the way up to you know 50 and change, just kicking myself like, why didn't I hold it? But now it's right back where it should be, which is $2. Again, this is the case of a, in my opinion, of a SPAC paying way too much money for a company to entice that company to come public. And they did that. Everyone gets all excited because the future, but the fundamentals are just not there. Boom, gone. Uh, both soft drink companies are diversified water. Yep. Yeah, though, I mean, yeah, they're, they have just, let's not call them soft drink companies. They're just beverage companies, right, Gary? If you look at Coke, you look at um, Pepsi, they all have every type of water product and energy drinks. They have, all, they have it all, so they're very diversified. I just sold my crypto in Voyager, very little, and I'm transferring the cash to my checking account. Oh, so you're out of crypto altogether. All right, I'm moving all mine. I'm not out of crypto. I'm just moving my crypto onto cold storage. So I have it on these little um, nano cold storage devices. I'm not gonna be earning yield on it for a little bit, but just making sure I can um, safely protect those assets until this storm blows over. I think what what will come from this, if we get clarity on this whole situation with regards to lending protocols and venture capitalists and how they're manipulating prices, et cetera, if we get some clarity, maybe some regulation, then uh, I'll feel better getting putting money back in. But we're just in the blip of a, a crypto winter, which was fueled by leverage and you know borrowing of assets. And all of a sudden it's catching up with everybody. So where's the bottom of the Rivian? <laughs> Let's see. And, and, you know, I don't know the answer to that one, but let's just check it from uh, perspective here. I mean, the only positive thing here for Rivian, well, number one is I'm actually seeing a lot of Rivian vehicles out and about, but it's, it's not making new lows. So if you look at what's happened for the past month, you know, you are in this little tiny range. I know it's, it's kind of consolidating, but it's not making it down to these prior lows at 19. So this is actually a rather positive sign, I would say, for Rivian. Do I think they're out of the woods? I, I I don't. Um, you know, the good news, like I say, they're selling vehicles. I see them all over the place down here in SoCal now. They're pretty actually a cool vehicle. I might actually go check one out. I don't think I'll buy one just because I don't want to spend that kind of money. Um, but I guess from a technical perspective, it stopped making new lows, which it has been doing pretty much since inception, right? So all in all, I, I think it's okay for now. But again, if we break those lows that we saw back on May 11th, to Don's point, yeah, it's probably going to keep on drifting lower and lower. I guess it's, are they going to burn through their cash and end up defaulting on stuff and going bankrupt? Or can they sell enough vehicles with the cash they have to keep um, revenue going and keep the business afloat? From what I hear, especially when Elon Musk talks about it, they don't. Um, and they'll probably end up drifting back down. But I don't know. I'm not trading Rivian. I actually was thinking about buying some down at a low level. Um, but, you know, you've got a couple of different ones. Here's Lucid. Same picture right? Horrible downtrend, consolidating, but not making new lows. That's great. And of course, for those of you who want to see scams, NKLA, you got Nikola. Nikola below single digits, getting, getting under five bucks. Oh man, that was so great back here when we talked about saying short this one. That was just beautiful. Anyway, um, what do you think we can see all-time highs in the markets two years? Um, at, at, uh, I don't know. Um, all-time highs in two years, I, I don't know if I can I, I say. There's just too many plausible scenarios, right? Scenario number one is these crashing commodity prices, which are plummeting right now, save the markets, drop inflation numbers, crude oil starts to drop, and then we all say, okay, inflation's under control and the Fed starts printing, and then maybe we can get back on track. And does that put us at all-time highs like in another year or two? Sure. That's probably, in my opinion, the best case scenario. In another situation, you have it where inflation continues to rise. We get um, They're going to have to start printing more money, but they can't, right? They can't print money because that fuels inflation. Unless you're California and just too stupid to realize that you shouldn't be printing more money, which I don't get. Um, you know, They need to remove money supply. So that gives them, um, they can't control inflation at that point if they're printing money. So remove money supply. That certainly is going to have an impact on the financial markets, which I think pushes it down further. And I think that might put us into a couple years out, maybe three or four years out. Um, I don't personally think we're going to hit that Great Depression type of uh, 
of, of place. But I think it ultimately depends on not the equity markets, not even necessarily the bond markets. For me personally, I think it's the housing market. If the housing market implodes and really starts to crash, then you start to get the defaults, and then that really adds fuel to a recession and possibly de de um, depression type of environment. But I don't know. It's all hypothesis. At this point, I think for me, Zed, the easiest thing to do is not think about two years out. Right? I Right now, I'm saying, how am I going to trade the next three, four, five months? Right? That, that is where I think I have the greater probability. Me trying to guess what happens in two years, five years, ten years, it's just a guess. Right? And, and I'd like to say I feel it's an educated guess. But let's be honest. It's just a guess. I think I have a much greater chance of anticipating market moves over the next you know weeks to months uh, than I would over years to, to decades. So I don't care. If we go into recession, so be it. I'll be, I'll be shorting these markets and hopefully riding it down. If it all of a sudden goes to all-time highs, so be it. I'll be going long. But uh, I, can't, I can't put too big of an opinion on where the markets will be. I have my ideas, but they're just my ideas. When you're buying puts on SPY, um, how do you determine your strike price? Um, generally by the premium. So to premium that I'm going to be paying if I'm going directional. So I'll go out, you know, obviously 90. Uh, the last set I did is 120 days. And I'm looking for what that cost of the premium is. It's a weird thing for me where I, look, I actually am trying to buy puts that are actually very cheap. So the put options that I bought for the SPY were the 320s. And if you look out here, you're going... SPY at 320? Well, yeah. I mean, you notice that that's this last huge area where it's bounced off of and, and really was the, the origin of this huge move. Uh, that said, it's not a strong demand zone, but I can see it being uh, a magnet and pulling price back down. So I looked at the 320s. I obviously uh, realized that there's a very slim chance of it getting there, which is fine, but I'm not, I'm not holding these options expiration. I mean, if it got to 320, that's another 16% slide from current price. So I bought them with that intent, um, but just because of the PCE price index numbers coming out tomorrow, uh, sorry, on Friday, made me a little bit, or are they coming out tomorrow? Uh, made me a little bit nervous about holding that. So let me, um, oh, I did this backwards, I think. So let me go and show you the, the data coming out tomorrow. Huh, that's really weird. I, I guess I, I screwed up here. Um, bear with me two seconds as I fix this uh, it's, I only have two minutes left, but I want to make sure I fix this slide because I screwed it up. Um, I put the wrong data in here because tomorrow's economic announcements, there is quite a bit of economic data coming out tomorrow, and I want to make sure I get this right. So there's 2B. Huh, okay. I think that this is it. Let me uh, put that right there, and I will share that with you guys. So here is what's happening for tomorrow. Yeah, there's... Uh, there. Huh. I don't know. I, I guess I, I got weird charts here. So they're, they're kind of repeating. But anyway, on the right-hand side, you look at you have Canadian GDP numbers coming out tomorrow. You also have personal income spending, unemployment claims, and then the core PCE price index. That actually is, they bumped it up. You guys might remember this was 0 0.3. I'll circle it over here so everybody can see what I'm talking about. 0.3 was the previous number, and this was 0.3. They just jumped it to 0.4. And um, my guess is they're going to come out at 0.3. I think you'll, you'll actually be the same. Um, but this is showing the anticipation is rising inflation numbers. Uh, the eco the um, commodities markets that we've been looking at, I think, will really start to show their hand in probably another three or four months. But it's going to take a little while. All right. I got to wrap up before Big Eb gloats about it being a one-hour show. What's the definition of depression? Um, it's the magnitude of the sell-offs or the magnitude of the declines of unemployment numbers or, or increase in unemployment, the magnitude of the declines with GDP. Remember, we start with two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth is what would de deem to be a recession, which we got today. All right. Uh, tomorrow's Thursday. I don't have any guests on the show for tomorrow, so I will uh, go off list or topics. For those of you who sent in about these junk coins, thank you very much. I appreciate those. Um, don't take too much offense to it. Just understand that your goal is to make money. And if you're trading junk stocks, you're basically juggling chainsaws, hoping to get lucky. Go with something that is fairly predictable, has a nice trend to it, and price action you can understand. And don't go, oh, I hope it goes up. That's just a recipe for disaster. So hopefully you guys, uh, that helped out some of you, don't just be discouraged by sending in questions. Send them into the YouTube channel. That helps me out. Uh, just put them down below any video and I will get to those questions. You can also email me. It's on the screen, tradermerlin at gmail.com. I hope that you guys have a fantastic remainder of your day. Big Ab, congrats. You got a one-hour show. I'll see you guys tomorrow.